Today you're going to be listening to a lecture about the introduction of Beowulf for your British Literature English 12 class. I'm Miss Morgenstern, and if you have any questions about this lecture, uh, you can leave a comment for me on our Google Classroom. Before we get started, uh, some things you should know about this lecture. Uh, you should be taking notes, um, and you can expect a quiz when we get back to school on September 27th. That's that Tuesday we get back. Um, some background of Beowulf before we get started. Uh, if you like heroes, if you like epic journeys, um, monsters, there's a lot of actually gore in this. Um, if you like any of those things or find those interesting, this will be a really great read for you. Beowulf is definitely not a dry text in any way, shape, or form. All right, an overview of our PowerPoint um, lecture and what I'm going to be talking about with you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about why we're reading Beowulf in the context of this British literature course. Um, we're also going to talk about Beowulf's provenance. Uh, that's like the history and origins of Beowulf because this particular text has a really interesting and um, convoluted history. We're going to be talking about the setting and background of Beowulf. Um, and some poetic devices and terms that you need to know before we get started reading. All right, so why are we studying Beowulf? Um, it's the oldest poem in the English language, um, and that being said, uh, most literature is going to stem from it in some way, shape, or form. Um, Beowulf encompasses common themes that we'll see all throughout our British literature course, so it's a really good foundation. Um, and then Beowulf is just a great story. It's well written um, and it's interesting. It's a page turner. Like I said before, it's not a boring text in the slightest. Uh, in some ways, it doesn't really matter what you read or how you read it. Um, and so since Beowulf's the first story that was written or epic poem that was written down, we might as well start there with British literature. All right, Beowulf's Prevenances. So we actually don't know quite a bit about Beowulf's origins. Uh, we don't know who wrote it, um, and we don't exactly know when it was written, um, but there are some speculations that we'll talk about. Um, and then we also don't know how much was based on historical truth. What we do know is that Beowulf is the oldest surviving English poem. It was written in Old English um, and during the setting of Anglo-Saxon time, the Anglo-Saxon people. Um, and it's based on the language that we speak today. We will not be reading the Old English version. You will have a side-by-side -side translation. You'll see uh, why we have that translation a little bit later on, but it would be extremely difficult to read um, without that translation. Um, some characters in the poem are actually did exist, so that's something that we do know about Beowulf. So some of these characters really did live um, during this uh, time period, and uh, you will see some kind of interesting history and ties to uh, myth and folklore and historical fact. Uh, and then we also know that the only copy of the manuscript was written sometime around the 11th century AD. The actual poem, however, dates from the 8th century, and the story's setting is actually placed even earlier, around 500 AD. Another thing that's really interesting about Beowulf is that there's a lot of Christian references in the poem, so we'll be really looking into the Christian influence of Beowulf. What's interesting about this is that the times and the time and the setting of the Anglo-Saxon period when it was when Beowulf is set is actually all based on pagan belief. So there's this weird blend of history um, where these cr Christian influences are taking over a text that should be primarily pagan. Um, this is probably most likely due to uh, monks that translated it um, when the manuscript was finally written. Um, monks obviously were the scholars. And so they're the ones who could read and write. And so they probably had some creative interpretation, so to speak, with Beowulf and the manuscript. So why wasn't it written down in the first place? Um, this was a oral story and was passed down um, through the centuries before it was actually written down. 
And it wasn't until after Norman, the Norman invasion in 1066 uh, that writing stories down became common in this part of the world. So really there wasn't people who were writing stories down. It was all just through oral tradition. Uh, what happened to the manuscripts since the 11th century? Um, it ended up with this guy right here. Uh, his name is Robert Cotton. And Cotton's library actually burned down in 1731, and a lot of manuscripts were entirely destroyed. Um, luckily, Beowulf was only partially damaged, and the manuscript is now preserved um, in the British Museum. All right, so let's talk about setting with Beowulf. So although Beowulf was written in English, uh, it is set in what is now Sweden, where a tribe called the Geats lived. The story may take place in, um, as early, like I said earlier, as early as 400 or 500 AD. So we're going to be seeing three major tribes in Beowulf, and the Geats are one of the major tribes that we will see. Okay. Uh, here's just a map to kind of get yourself oriented. Uh, this is present-day Europe, where we have Sweden and Denmark, um, and a kind of more of a zoomed-up map of when we have Beowulf setting. The Geats are here, we have the Swedes up north, um, the Jutes are to the west, um, and so this, those are kind of our three major um, groups, so the Jutes, the Swedes, and the Geats. Uh, here's another map that just kind of shows placement of where these people were. Uh, the angles were up north, the Jutes were down to the south, and then the Saxons were in the middle. Um, so they're, one of the issues that comes up with this historically is that we have a lot of different tribes, a lot of different people, um, all in close quarters. And so as we know with history, um, that doesn't necessarily always work out very well. And so there's a lot of war and invasions and conflict. All right, so the version we're reading was likely composed in 680 and uh, 835, uh, though it might be set a little earlier. Um, and like I said, the timeline, we're not quite sure, so we're only speculating. Um, some things that we actually know did occur. In 521 AD, the death of, he oh gosh, okay, here we go, Heolak, he he okay, the death of Heolak, um, and he's mentioned in the poem. So this was a character that actually did live. Um, Heolak is one of the many names of characters that we are going to have to hurdle over um, while we read Beowulf. Uh, in 680 AD, the appearance of a literate sorry, alliterative verse uh, show, started to show up. Um, and a lot of you probably have heard about alliteration, right? Similar sounds, the seashell, seashore, that thing. Um, alliterative verse is a little different, um, but it does have that same concept of similar sounds. We'll talk about that a little bit later in more detail. Um, and then in eight, uh, 835 AD, the Danish started raiding other areas. After this, a, f a few poets would consider them heroes. Okay, uh, so Beowulf is, uh, oh goodness, um, he's not a Danish, but uh, like we said earlier with those three other groups, um, they're going to be fighting and raiding. And so this poem uh, depicts Beowulf as a hero type, um, but really any time after this period, uh, they weren't considered heroes because they were pillaging and invading other people's homes. All right, Anglo-Saxon society. So this is something that we're going to be talking about all throughout the reading of Beowulf. So uh, definitely pay attention to this. Uh, Beowulf provides a strong, histor uh, strong history of Anglo-Saxon life, values, and society at the time the Beowulf was written. So kind of what we did with your summer reading, um, we're putting Beowulf in historical context, okay? And, we're and we are going to explore Beowulf as a product of its time. Uh, traits valued um, by the Anglo-Saxons had... Uh, 
excuse me, sorry, um, some of the traits that were valued in Anglo-Saxon time were courage, bravery, strength, loyalty, and obedience to one's lord, generosity, willingness to engage in battle, and the quest for fame. Those are really important um, traits and values that we'll be looking at all throughout the text, um, and you may or may not see on a future quiz, so I would take the time right now to write them down. Um, so this is an aristocratic poem, so we're only going to be worrying about the upper class, the kings, the royalty. Um, this epic poem is not going to deal with the common folk at all. We don't really see that um, until really uh, Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales in literature. All right, so um, paganism. All right, polytheistic belief, meaning they worship multiple gods, okay? Um, and an example of this is uh, Seven, whose names were based on the names of the days of the week. So like Sunday um, and Saturday, those were based off of gods that um, uh, the Anglo-Saxon people worshipped. All right, poetry and Beowulf. So I said we'd mention alliterative verse a little bit later. Uh, so here's a quick and uh, simple definition of alliterative verse. Uh, alliterative verse has repetition of initial sounds of words, and they occur in every line. Uh, generally, they're four feet beats per line. Uh, there's a seishura, or a pause, between beats two and four, and there is no rhyme. Okay, so here's where I was talking about the original um, text of Beowulf. Uh, before you, you have the opening lines to Beowulf in Old English. Um, the reason why I'm showing this to you is because of this uh, right here. These three lines are examples of... Um, alliter alliterative verse. Okay, so how you would pronounce that first line, oft shield shaping sh shape sorry shapina paratium. So that's off shield shaping shapina paratium. So notice here that we have this c a c uh sorry s c sound which actually is pronounced with a uh, sh sound in our present day English um, and you have all of this repetition right here of sounds so what we are noticing is that we have these three similar sounds in a row and that we have a break here between the two different similar sounds okay um, and it continues on throughout uh, this old English version now, the reason I showed you the Old English version is because most of the alliterative verse is lost in our translation. Um, here's what that first line actually means in translation uh, in English. There was shield, shafson, scourging of many tribes. Okay, so this uh, head of this big tribe um, and how powerful this person is. All right, another point of liter or sorry, uh, poetic terms that you should know is kennings. Uh, kennings are compound metaphors. They're usually two words, uh, and then most were probably used over and over. Okay, so here's some examples of kennings from Beowulf that you're going to see. So um, if you, we were reading the old version. Uh, it would be Banas, uh, but in our translated version, we'll see Bone House. Uh, bone House is translated to body, okay? So it's a compound, um, like I said before, it is a compound metaphor. All right, uh, you'll also see Gold Friend of Men, which is a generous prince, uh, Ring Giver, which is a lord, or the fla or Flashing Light, which is a sword. Um, we'll be making a list of kennings as we read um, to kind of make sure that we all understand what they mean. All right, Light Totes. All right, liatotes are a negative expression, usually an understatement. So an example of this, and I'm sure you guys use these all the time, is they do not seem like the happiest couple around, or your room is not a complete disaster, right? So it's an understatement that actually gives more of a negative impression. 
Okay, some terms you should know. A scope is a bard or a storyteller. Um, and the scope was responsible for praising deeds and past heroes or recording history uh, for provi and for providing entertainment. So this is where uh, Scope would be writing about Beowulf because he was such an epic hero um, that they wanted to tell his story. Uh, kamitas uh, literally means escort or comrade. This term identifies the concept of warriors and lords um, uh, mutually pledging their loyalty to one another. Okay, so uh, bond for life, so to speak, with warriors. A thane is a warrior. Mead hall is a large dining hall where the warriors, uh, basically the warriors' quarters, where they ate and slept and had ceremonies. A word this is uh, directly translated as fate. This is going to be a major theme, um, well, right now a motif, uh, but a theme that we'll be exploring throughout the text. Uh, and it's an idea uh, that is frequently in our poem uh, where it references Christian uh, values of God's will. Okay, So this is where that Christian value comes in. Uh, an epic. Beowulf is an epic poem. Uh, when you get back to class, uh, we'll be talking about what uh, are characteristics of an epic poem. Um, and usually epic poems have an epic hero with a big universal conflict that needs to be uh, somehow uh, resolved through a big journey and big lots of big obstacles. Uh, elegy is a poem that is sad or mournful, and uh, the majority of us should know homily, um, but it's like a sermon um, that's written uh, that gives advice. Uh, some themes to look out for while we start reading Beowulf, uh, good versus evil, uh, religion and religious influences, the importance of wealth, so especially because this is a, an aristocratic uh, poem where we're only talking about the high up class and the kings and the princes, that's going to be really important. The importance of the sea and sailing, especially for these people um, and the setting that Beowulf has. Uh, the sanctity of home, um, not only as a sanctuary, but also as a um, place for camaraderie and a place uh, where there's this bond that cannot be broken, uh, which also leads into loyalty and allegiance. Uh, fate, right, word, um, as it will be referenced, um, and then heroism and heroic deeds. So what you're going to do is... Um, when you get back to class, so on Monday the 26th, uh, we're going to be going over your senior project. And then Tuesday we will pick up Beowulf. Um, we'll have a little quick PowerPoint about epic poems and we will jump right into the text. Don't forget, uh, you are responsible for knowing all this information um, and you can expect a quiz on Tuesday the 27th. Have a great day.